Hello, welcome to Weathersnap. It's Friday the 2nd of September and I'm Claire Nazir. Joining me to talk through this week's weather and climate headlines, Alex Deacon. Alex, what's coming up? Well, we've got the latest on tropical cyclone activity from around the globe and, well, autumn has just started, meteorological autumn. So what happens through the meteorological summer in the UK? How high and how low? And we'll also be looking ahead to the storm season. So yes, exciting stuff coming up. But first of all, let's just take a check of what's been happening in Pakistan. It's made international news through the last week. A huge swathe of the country annihilated by too much rain. Many towns submerged, buildings, bridges and roads have collapsed under the sheer weight of the torrents. Now, we know Pakistan sees monsoonal rain every year. It tops up the water levels and ensures farmland remains fertile during the very hot and dry season that precedes the monsoon. But this is just beyond the norm, isn't it, Alex? I mean, you know, those images just coming out on on social media and on the news have just been devastating. Absolutely terrifying just to see those pictures. You just you just can't imagine it, can you? Just absolutely just scares you just to think about it. Really does. Let's just put it in perspective. So this season, there's been an unbroken cycle of monsoon rains, persistent heavy weather for eight weeks, leaving, as I said, huge swathes of the country underwater. Now, the Pakistani environmental minister described the event as a monster monsoon wreaking nonstop havoc throughout the country. Now, during August, rainfall rates have been nine times higher than average across the Sindh province. Now, the Sindh province, we sometimes talk about it in weather snap because it gets really high temperatures during pre-monsoon heat and five times higher across much of the whole of Pakistan. And I'm just going to give you some really tragic numbers now just to really get an understanding of the enormity of this situation. 33 million people have been affected. That's pretty much half of the UK population. So that's just huge. 3.1 million people have been displaced. Fatalities so far have been in excess of 1,000. 300,000 homes destroyed. Livestock killed in excess of 700,000. So how do people really recover from such an event? It's really hard to fathom, to be honest, But there have been many contributing factors that has led up to this event, which happened over the last week, Alex. Yeah, like you say, a number of factors, a couple of which you've already hinted at there. The intensity of the monsoon rains is obviously the obvious one. But actually, this kind of started before that with that incredible heat that we had during the springtime. Pakistan is full of glaciers. Uh, It may seem a bit strange, but it is. It's it's got a lot of glaciers, uh, and that's what we're seeing happening here, the glacial melt. And you get these things called glacial lake outburst floods, or GLOFs for short, where meltwater lakes, so lakes that are there as natural when when you get meltwater during the summer months, but they burst their banks just because of the amount of of rainfall and amount of of glacial melt that we've seen. And they burst their banks and it all floods downstream. So that's one of the, the big key factors. And what's contributed to that was the intensity of the heat in the spring. 1st of May, temperatures hit 49.3 degrees Celsius in southeastern parts of Pakistan. So that early heat started the glacial melt earlier and contributed to more glacial melt, bringing more of these high profile gloffs. We also then saw more pre-monsoon thunderstorms. Again, kind of late springtime, there were more thunderstorms than normal, triggered by the hot air. So that heat, again, a contributing factor. So that kind of triggered the fact that the ground was then going to be more saturated earlier because you had these uh, intense thunderstorms early on. Then the actual monsoons themselves arrived a little bit earlier across parts of Pakistan. So again, increasing the ground saturation. And then just the fact that the monsoon was that intense, you quoted the numbers there nine times more across some areas. And that's partly because of the way that the frontal rain or the, the, the monsoon rain band, if you like, just kind of stalled. Plus, we had a series of um, monsoonal lows drifting in as well, coming around the top from Bangladesh that also intensified the rainfall. So it's it's a number of factors, meteorological speaking. Let's not forget also the regions where deforestation over decades also does exacerbate water flow and runoff too. All that with the background of, of, of climate change, of course. So that is, it's, it's really is a number of factors that have contributed to these floods. So there are local factors across the Indian subcontinent, but scientists are also calling 
in the extended La Nina phase that affects many seasonal weather patterns around the world. Yeah, and it's a key factor. We've seen it in Pakistan floods in the past as well. People are comparing these floods this year to the ones of 2010 that caused similar devastation. And both years, uh, the consistent factor there is a La Nina, uh, strong La Ninas as well. In fact, for the months of May through to July, the two strongest La Nina years of the 21st century happened to be in those two years, 2010 and 2022. So there is a strong link between uh, La Ninas, strong La Ninas and flooding that happens in Pakistan. Interesting, actually, earlier this summer, the Hindu Times reported positive story with the rainfalls across India. So La Nina leading to heavier rains across India, which, of course, are absolutely vital for life in in some form. You need some rains. It's just getting the right amount. I mean, the river levels have been at record levels throughout this period. Um, The heavy monsoon rains are now easing across this part of the world but there's still significant river flooding damage. And that's going to continue across northwest India, southern parts of Pakistan, uh, particularly impacting the Indus and the wider catchment area through into the weekend. So let's go from Pakistan east to Japan, where the country is bracing itself for the arrival of a typhoon. Yeah, quite a big one. This as well, Super Typhoon Hinam Noor. Strongest tropical cyclone of 2022 so far across this part of the world. It's had a really unusual track. It's kind of been gradually meandering its way westwards uh, across the uh, Pacific. Nothing unusual about that. But it it kind of dips southwards towards Taiwan. But the the path is now expected to almost do a 180 and head due north, reverse its direction, move northwards. It's going to affect the Korean Peninsula and perhaps parts of uh, Japan as we head into the early part of next week. Most concerning factor about this is it, it's likely to intensify, or a lot of the computer models have it intensifying as it heads northwards and before it makes landfall on potentially very heavily populated areas. It's certainly likely to bring heavy rain, but yeah, the, the wind strength is something to watch here because if it does intensify, those winds are going to be very damaging indeed. And of course, with all these uh, tropical storms, one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest cause of fatality is always going to be a storm surge. So yeah, three pronged attack from this storm and, and really interesting track and definitely one we need to keep an eye on. Yes. And obviously um, the Met Office Storms Twitter feed keeps us updated every day. And so check out that if you are concerned, if you have relatives and family, uh, friends across that part of the world. And a little closer to home, it's been very quiet across the southern part of the North Atlantic where the hurricanes brew and develop. However, something strange is happening across the subtropics of the North Atlantic. Earlier, I spoke to Met Office tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming, who told me more about this development across the mid-Atlantic. The Atlantic hurricane season has been rather strange so far. We had uh, three storms early in the season and then a very quiet period. In fact, we went through the whole of August without a storm in the Atlantic, and that's the first time that's happened since 1997. But uh, right on cue at the beginning of September, we have activity developing uh, three potential areas of development. And in particular, we're looking at a storm in the subtropical uh, waters, so quite high latitude in the Atlantic which is now Tropical Storm Danielle. And we expect that to be fairly slow moving in the next few days, stay out over the open ocean. So there's not likely to be any land impacts in the near future. And we do expect it then to eventually move northwards or possibly northeastwards and become uh, an extra tropical or post-tropical system. So it could get picked up by our jet stream And we may see some rain associated with it, but it's a long way off yet. Yes, we expect it to uh, meander or move fairly slowly over the next week. And there's there's two possible scenarios. It could continue to move northwards out into the open ocean of the higher latitude parts of the Atlantic. But there is some possibility it could move more towards the east, in which case it could come closer to the, uh, the UK and Western Europe. But that would be over a week away. So there's still a lot of uncertainty there as to whether there's going to be any potential land impacts. And elsewhere, the hurricane season is now looking like it's becoming more active. 
Yes, there are two other areas for storm development over the Atlantic, one just to the uh, east of the Caribbean and another one just off the west coast of Africa. And we're reaching the time of year, the first part of September, which is climatologically the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season. And so it's not surprising to see uh, these developments. So, uh, yes, it's, it looks like after a very quiet start to the season, we could be seeing more activity over the coming week, at least, if not longer. My thanks to tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming. And I know our colleague Aidan McGiven has shot a film about how X hurricanes can impact the UK. So check that out on our YouTube Learn About Weather channel. So Julian mentioned there has been a distinct lack of hurricanes across the tropical Atlantic basin so far. In fact, we've seen that it's been the situation across the UK, Western Europe, where things have been decidedly dry and not a lot of rain at all. The summer stats are now in for the UK. Alex, you've got the headlines. Yeah, plenty to get our teeth into here with these summer stats. Obviously, it'll be remembered for the incredible heat wave that we had in July. But there were also hot spells in June and August. And overall, it was a hot and dry summer. In fact, it's been a a hot year as well. Since January this year, every single month has had a monthly mean temperature warmer than average. And actually, we can go back even further than that, tracing it back through autumn and winter of last year. So that's 12 months in a row where temperatures have been warmer than the average. And that's never been recorded before. It's also been incredibly dry, of course, the driest year so far for the UK and England since 1976. Going back further, the 15th driest for the UK and the fifth driest for England in that series that goes back to 1836. Uh, So, yeah, very warm, very dry, but, you know, quite a bit of variation as well. A number of individual counties have also had their warmest summer on record. That's mean temperature and maximum temperature. And the UK has broadly seen sunnier than average weather, although parts of Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland have been duller than average. And Alex, it's a bit strange, isn't it? We've been, obviously, we broadcast every day for the Met Office to talk about rain, to talk about low pressure. And all of this is coming up in your forecast in a few moments. And also a a warning for rain, which is something we haven't seen for a long, long time. We've seen some thunderstorm warnings, but not sort of a broad yellow warning for dynamic rain. So all of that coming up in a moment. Now, Thursday, the 1st of September, marks the beginning of the storm season. And yes, the Met Office have released this year's storm names. It's exciting times. I mean, every year we look forward to this to see what names are going to be on that list. Obviously, we don't really want them to happen, but it's an interesting process. And certainly for you, Alex, because you hosted the Met Office Twitter space talking about storm names. On which you featured as well, Claire. Yeah, so uh, really <laughs> exciting to be to be able to, to to be able to host a Twitter space with a number of high profile weather presenters from across the board. Now, obviously, as you mentioned, when when storms are happening, it's a it's a pretty serious matter. But when we release the names, we're actually able to have a, a little bit more fun with it, and actually that does help with the reach and actually getting the attention of people. That's the whole point of naming storms. That's why we do it, so that people are aware of this system, are aware that a named storm means something serious. So that is why we do it. We released the names on Thursday morning. And then, yeah, Thursday afternoon, I hosted uh, this Twitter space, which had your good self on it, along with Laura Tobin from GMB, Simon King from Radio 5 Live, and Sarah Thornton, founder of uh, Weather Trending and also BBC Regional Presenter. So we got quite a spectrum of different people's opinions about you know they're the communicators uh, when it comes to storms that's why we rely on them and again the whole point is to let people be aware so yeah it was really good that was on twitter spaces but you can catch up so if you're following the met office on twitter we posted it yesterday you can catch up and go back and listen to that again just finally on the the subject of storm names they are nominated by the general public but it's not just the UK, is it? We are in partnership with Metairon, which is the Republic of Ireland Meteorological Office, and also the Dutch Met Service as well. So that's why some of the names are perhaps a little bit more Dutch or Celtic, which is great, a, a sort of really broad sway, then also representing the diversity of the UK as well. So any favourites from your list this year, Alex? 
I really like B, Betty, because my grandmother was called Betty. That was the one we had a vote for. So we actually did a kind of knockout competition on Twitter for that. So people could have a could have a vote on it. As you say, we get a lot of suggestions in each year and you can suggest a name at any time on the website. We take those all into account and then we come up with a few. And then, as I say, we go through to, to Met Aaron and uh, K&MI and it's a, it's a big discussion. But I really like Betty because my grandmother was called Betty. And I think that's that's a strong name for a storm. Was your grandmother formidable? She, I mean, I don't think you'd call her formidable, but she was um, she was definitely a character. So, yes, talking about autumn, it's uh, the beginning of meteorological autumn. And if by magic the weather has changed from high pressure to low pressure, Alex, just give us the top line of the details through the weekend and into next week. Yeah, well, we've had high pressure dominating throughout summer, which is why we've had a hot and a dry summer. It's all changed. Low pressure's moving in and it's not moving in very far. We've kind of got a change in the jet stream. So the jet stream's drifting southwards and kind of forming a loop. And you're going to get just this low pressure milling around just to the west of the UK. And it's going to throw bands of heavy rain across the country. Welcome rain for some, of course, after such a dry summer, but still going to be quite showery across the east. So they're going to be hit and miss the showers here. Where we're looking at more persistent rain, Northern Ireland, southwest Scotland, that's where we've got this yellow rain warning in place throughout Saturday. That rain could really build up starting overnight Friday and then lasting for much of Saturday. So that's parts of Northern Ireland, southwest Scotland. More details on that warning, of course, on our website. And then the low stays there and just throws further bands of showers our way during Sunday as well. So again, hit and miss showers for England and Wales, but some pretty intense downpours in places. Maybe a more persistent rain on Sunday for parts of Wales. And again, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing these slow moving bands of rain. Going to get quite windy in places as well. Uh, brisk easterly wind across northern Scotland but elsewhere around that low if you can picture that low sitting over Ireland the winds are coming in from the southwest so still bringing quite warm and humid air so it could turn quite misty and murky in places where the winds ease off but equally where the sun does pop out between the showers it'll still feel quite warm so quite a mixed weekend but it is yeah dominated by low pressure rather than high pressure so a very different feel and no change into the early part of next week with that low uh, sticking around bringing further heavy showers in places Monday and Tuesday. Thanks, Alex. Well, just before we go, let's head over to Martin Bowles, who has last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for last week, measured between Monday the 22nd of August and Sunday the 28th of August. No fewer than five locations achieved the highest temperature of the week. Cavendish in Suffolk, Charlwood and Wisley in Surrey, and St James's Park and North Holt in London all recorded 29.5 degrees Celsius on Wednesday. The lowest temperature was 2.3 Celsius at Loch Glass Carnock in Cromarty, northern Scotland, early on Friday morning. South East England has been waiting patiently for rainfall for several weeks, and finally some came last Thursday, rather a lot in fact, enough to cause some surface flooding in a few places. The highest recorded daily figure was 76.2 mm at Brooms Barn in Suffolk. The sunniest place was Leckenfield in Humberside, where 12.2 hours were recorded on Saturday. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for listening and thank you to Alex Deacon as well. And we'll see you next week. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.